everyone. Hello, hello, and welcome to another edition of the School of Business and Economics Fireside Chat, where we try to bring in experts on topics of politics and economics and foreign policy that are of top of mind interest to our students and faculty at SSU and also the community at large here in North Bay. My name is Puspa Amri. I'm an associate professor of economics, and I teach courses in international finance, Banyan banking, and principles of macroeconomics, as well as intermediate economics. A very warm welcome to everyone. Today, we have a wonderful topic on what is the role of U.S. financial sanctions in the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency. And for that purpose, we are very honored and pleased to have with us today uh, Professor Daniel McDowell. Welcome, Dan. Let me introduce uh, Professor McDowell briefly. Uh, Professor McDowell is an Associate Professor of Political Science at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. Uh, Professor McDowell has uh, research interest in international in the international politics of money, and he has written uh, two books. Uh, his most recent book is the focus of our conversation today, which is called, titled "Backing the Buck: uh, U.S. Financial Sanctions and International Backlash Against the Dollar." Uh, but Professor McDowell has also written a number of articles in peer-reviewed journals where he discusses the global financial crisis, the International Monetary Fund, and the politics of lending at the International Monetary Fund and a number of international articles on the Chinese renminbi and its internalization, which I myself have assigned to my students in my class. So welcome, Dan. It's a pleasure to have you here. Puspa, it's great to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. Right on. So for the audience, uh, I'm going to be in conversation with Professor McDowell. Uh, we have about 30 minutes, maybe if we can go over a little bit, five minutes after, but I'll be in conversation with Professor McDowell for about uh, two thirds of this event. And after that, we'll open up the floor to Q&A. So for the participants that are here today, feel free to use the Q&A button or the chat button to ask your questions, and I will pass them on to our speaker today. Right. Hopefully that's the logistics that will work out today. And uh, I'll go ahead and begin. Right. All right. Uh, so, Dan, again, thank you for being with us today. The U.S. dollar has undeniable dominance in international markets. The vast majority of global trade and financial transactions are invoiced and settled using the U.S. dollar. And it's been pretty this way for at least since the end of World War II. The U.S. dollar is also a very popular store of value. Uh, yet, as you know, uh, every once in a while, there seems to be rumors or speculations that the greenback is about to lose its importance. It's about to meet its demise in the global stage. We heard this at least after the 2008 global financial crisis. Uh, and these rumors have intensified over the past two years since the war in Ukraine. So to first set the, the, set the stage for our chat today, uh, let me begin with some broad overview questions, background questions. How did the U.S. dollar arrive at this exorbitant position as the global reserve currency? Is it by luck or did the U.S. government actually actively pursue an internalization, internationalization of the dollar? And I'll also be curious to hear your thoughts, whether you think it's good or bad for the U.S. to have this exorbitant status. That's a great uh, starting point, Buspa, and, and thanks again uh, for, for having me, and thanks to everyone who's uh, in attendance today. Hopefully, you have lots of time to, to get to Q&A at the end as well. Um, I look forward to the conversation. So let's let's kind of, yeah, begin with a quick background on, on how did we get here in the first place. Um, you know, typically, the things that uh, economists point to that determine whether a currency sort of reaches that uh, that role as a major international currency, focus on economic uh, conditions uh, and policy choices of uh, the, the, the state that issues that currency. And I think that's true for the United States overall. So we can talk about, I would say, three main things here, the size and significance of the U.S. economy in the world. Second is U.S. Um, policy choices. And then finally, I'll briefly talk about something what we could call inertia or maybe path dependence, which is also important here. So first, right, historically, currencies of large countries that play a major role in world trade, those are the currencies that tend to emerge as major international currencies. And we know that by the end of the 19th century, the U.S. economy was the world's largest economy. By the 1930s, it was the world's top trading state. And it was really during that period, the interwar period, that um, the dollar surpasses the British pound as the most internationally used currency. But it's not, as you mentioned earlier, but it's not really until after World War II that the dollar sort of reaches um, the sort of 
uh, sort of level of dominance that we kind of associate with it today. And that is, of course, because of the Bretton Woods system, which I know, as you know very well, right, uh, centers on the dollar, which is the only currency after the war that is pegged to a commodity gold, right, um, fixed against gold, the only convertible currency into, into gold. Um, and then all other currencies in the system are pegged to the U.S. dollar, right? So it's the linchpin currency. And uh, by virtue of that, right, it is literally at the center of the monetary system. And it becomes really the only true convertible into gold reserve currency that countries can hold. And so countries start to build up reserves in the dollar in part because of that. We also know that at the end of the Second World War, the U.S. is the world's the largest economy by far, mm -hmm. right? Really sort of Absolutely. at its its peak. And it's exporting dollars to Europe through foreign aid, like the Marshall Plan. And so dollars are, are sloshing around the world economy, being used for payment for goods and imports into those places. So that's sort of emerging in that cross-border payments role there. Um, of course, by the end of the 60s and then early 70s, Bretton Woods is under stress. And so the, the dollar uh, is ultimately delinked from gold, but that doesn't undermine its role. If anything, it kind of supercharges it because as you know, under Bretton Woods, countries maintained strict capital controls, financial flows cross-border were, were restricted. In the 1970s and 80s, countries are deregulating their uh, their financial systems, including sort of dismantling those cross-border uh, regulations on capital flows. And so what happens is America's big financial markets are now freely open to the world, and foreign capital flows into the U.S. Um, uh, the U.S. government starts to run more persistent uh, uh, budget deficits, which means the U.S. government is issuing more debt. So there's uh, right more uh, capital flowing in to fund those uh, th those uh, U.S. deficits and really just further entrenches the dollar's role, uh, especially in the investment role here. Um, if we think about trade. Uh, markets tend to coalesce around one currency here. So big firms tend to be in the biggest economies, right? So your biggest multinational firms, again, in that post-war era are, are in the United States. They're pricing their goods in dollars. So competitors also end up pricing in dollars in other countries. And before you know it, the entire system is sort of settled on the US dollar as the currency for cross-border trade. And once everybody's sort of settled on that role, this is where we get to that point about inertia. Um, uh, even though the United States economy has shrunk relative to the world since the end of World War II, it's still the largest, but it's lost right significant sort of share of the world economy, and now has been surpassed over a decade ago by China as the world's top trading country. It you know the dollar hasn't lost its its uh, centrality. Why? Because there is this sort of inertia or path dependence. Once markets have settled on a choice, there's little incentive to change. Right. Um, so that's sort of I guess a quick story. And then lastly, you asked like, is this good? Um, you know, there is more debate about this now than I think there used mm -hmm. to be. Michael Pettis has been very vocal about why he thinks, for instance, that dollar dominance is actually a bad thing for the U.S. and for the world. I, I think on balance, most experts still think it's good. I would concur with this just very briefly. Right. Issuing a global currency means that the United States can borrow more cheaply uh, than it would otherwise, which means the government can run fiscal deficits for longer, uh, larger fiscal deficits for longer, uh, because foreigners are basically loaning their savings to the U.S. government at, at very low costs. Um, and, you know, in trade settlement, that's good for you. Use of the dollar in trade settlement, that's good for U.S. firms that are involved in trade because they don't have to worry about foreign exchange risk. You don't have to worry about the currency that you're getting paid in being a, a, a foreign currency. And then if the value of that changes with relation to your national currency, that affects, right, um, your earnings. That is a risk that you have to hedge against. American firms don't have to worry about that. We see this in the world now when, when uh, the dollar gets stronger, oil gets more expensive, right, for developing and emerging countries. That's a challenge they have to deal with that if you're in the United States. You don't have to worry about that really in any aspect of trade if you're involved in the global economy. It's good for the financial sector. There are other small benefits. And then lastly, because I know this will pivot us into your next question, mm -hmm. um, having the, the dominant currency means you have the capacity to use financial sanctions, which is um, quite an important power. Wonderful, Dan. Thank you so much. Yeah. Who's not? What's not to love about this exorbitant privilege, right? You can borrow with lower interest rate. You can run larger uh, budget deficits. Uh, and you could potentially use it as a tool to punish uh, uh, actors in the international stage who run against your economic and political interests. Wonderful. Uh, so that does perfectly segue into my next question. Uh, you read my mind, uh, Dan. Uh, I want to talk more about what gives the U.S. its power to uh, impose financial sanctions. And in your recently published book, Bucking the Buck, U.S. Financial Sanctions and International Backlash Against the U.S. Dollar, and you even gave a testimony to a U.S. congressional hearing on this topic over the summer, right, Dan? 
I I, I watch that with like, oh, this is so cool. <laughs> anyway, uh, that book gave a very detailed explanation about where the U.S. Uh, derives its power to impose sanctions, financial sanctions, to be more precise, as different from more traditional economic uh, sanctions. So my next question is actually twofold, and I would love uh, for you to answer uh, uh uh, whichever question, whichever order you'd like to answer it. Uh, the first one is, uh, you argue that um, global demand for U.S. dollar is actually not only explained by economic factors, but also by foreign policy. Perhaps our audience would love to hear more about why that is. And in the second part is, uh, you also argued in your book that because of the centrality of the U.S. dollar and the com combined with the outsized role American banks play in global transactions, uh, U.S. government can actually sanction anyone it dis dislikes, for lack of a better word. Um, can you elaborate and guide us as to how uh, that power works? Yeah, for sure. Well, why don't we start with the second one there, sort of getting through the the um, sort of how, how sanctions function and what is it that, that gives the United States this capability. And then we can come back to this question about um, how, how governments consider foreign policy and politics increasingly when they're making decisions about um, the dollar and whether to sort of be, be reliant or as reliant on the currency. Um, so yeah, so, so we can sort financial sanctions and you're right to distinguish them from other forms like, you know, embargoes, trade embargoes, more traditional forms of economic sanctions. I would separate them into two broad groups. So on the one hand, there are sanctions that cut off an actor's access to its wealth. We would call that like an asset freeze, right? So similar to seizing an oligarch's yacht, you might freeze their bank accounts and so they can't get to their dollars. On the other hand, right, there are sanctions that prevent an actor, could be an individual, could be a firm, a business, could be a government institution prevents that actor or entity from participating in cross-border transactions. And so you're basically blocking them from making or receiving payment in the international financial system. And that could be payment for trade or payment for debt, right? But basically cutting them out of cross-border payments. So I think we'll, we'll focus mostly on the second part because that's actually where most of the technical stuff is. And it's really, I think, the more potent part of financial sanctions. Um, so international payments, it's important to recognize, right, are the lifeblood of the world economy, right? Anytime an individual or an entity services a foreign debt or invests in a foreign asset, a, a cross-border payment is made, right? It's moving across borders between banks. Even world trade, which is maybe surprising to some people, is highly dependent on cross-border payments. So something like 90% of commercial exchanges worldwide depend on banks to provide some form of trade finance or intermediation between the importer and the exporter, right? So access to the banking system, to the payment system is really critical to maintaining economic relationships. Um, okay, so payment systems really rely on three fundamental components. They've got to have uh, the medium of exchange, which is the currency that we're using to make or receive payment. Uh, the second thing would be the pipes or the ductwork through which the currency or the payments flow. And the third thing would be the communication network, um, which allows banks to communicate with each other. So briefly, medium of exchange, we talked, you know, you mentioned this at the outset, right? The dollar is the choice most of the time. We can come back to this maybe later, but roughly half of cross-border payments are made in dollars. So chances are, if you're transacting across borders, you're using dollars, okay? Um, the the, the ductwork or the pipe, so to speak, um, which is sort of the, the, the pipes through which those dollars flow, those are correspondent bank accounts. I won't get into all the details for time here, but basically the point that we need to recognize here is that nearly all dollars that move across borders flow through less than 50 big major banks, and they all have operations in the United States. Okay. Can you they're, give an example then of a of a bank? Sorry, not to interrupt you. Can you give sure? JP Morgan, right? JP Morgan's ah, one of them. Okay. okay? So, okay. but there are also foreign banks that are in the United States, uh, United States that have operations in the U.S. Um, that are part of what's called the clearinghouse interbank payment system. Chips is what it's called. Uh, most people haven't heard of it, but it's really at the heart of the cross border dollar payment system. And so, uh, right, fewer than fifty banks are in between all of these financial transactions that cover around 95% of all dollars that move around the world, okay? So you can think about it like an airport system, right? Anytime you move from one small city to another city, chances are you're connecting in a major airport hub. And if we looked at the way air traffic moves around the United States, right? They're connecting in a small number of major hubs, same logic with banks. The key here, and I'll come back to this, is that those banks are operating in the US and so they're subject to US law. And then the last thing we mentioned is sort of the communication lines. How do banks talk to each other and say, hey, we need to move money from this account in this country to this account in this country. And that's SWIFT, another acronym, Society for Worldwide Interbank 
financial telecommunications. It's based in Belgium. This is uh, the, the market standard. It processes something like 50 million orders, payment orders a day, uh, valued at around $5 trillion. Okay, that's that's uh, the, the, the amount of money that we're talking about here globally. Um, okay, so how does that give the U.S. control over um, how this works? The key here is really the ductwork. Um, communication sure. lines are important too, but the ductwork, those correspondent accounts, those 50 or so banks, okay, are really critical. So the United States, if it wants to cut an actor out of the payment system, what does it do? The U.S. president issues an executive order that tells the U.S. Treasury that it needs to add that new actor or entity, or usually it's a group of actors or entities, right, um, to what's called the specially designated national list, the SDN list. It's effectively a blacklist. And once Treasury adds their, these names to the list, the banks um, that I mentioned before, and, and actually all banks in the U.S., but those key 50 banks are really crucial, they get that list and they see, okay, we are not allowed to conduct business on behalf of these, these entities that are listed by treasury. And if we do, we're gonna get fined in the billions of dollars. Me as an individual, if I'm participating willingly in helping uh, one of these SDNs make a payment, I can get thrown in jail, right? So you self-police as a bank and enforce that law. And what happens is targets, those SDNs find themselves unable to access their money, right? They can't withdraw their funds. They can't receive payments. So if it's a, a firm that's you know, involved in exporting goods around the world, it might not be able to, uh, to actually complete those deals anymore because the banks that, that do its business are no longer answering its phone call. So it's control over those pipes of the ductwork through which dollars flow that really gives the US government this ability. Wow, that sounds like a very great uh, simplified explanation using a wonderful technology. I didn't realize that there were so few banks that play a role in settling the transactions that make up about 95% of uh, cross-border financial transactions. And the fact that they're mostly located in the U.S., is what you said gives them the U.S. government then the power to cut off any individual foreign government or individual. Or in, can you give a recent example of of um, of foreign governments or foreign actors or even institutions yeah, that have been sure. a uh, target of this financial sanction? Yes, yeah, gr great question about examples, right? So you know, one of the interesting things about financial sanctions is they can be very specific. Okay. So it can be an individual. It might be, um, right, a, let's say, someone involved in, say, criminal activity that's not even affiliated with a government. It might be someone in organized crime, someone in a, a drug cartel, for instance, and the U.S. government wants to basically financially isolate them and prevent them from being able to use the banking system. Um, it could be an individual with close ties to a government that you want to apply pressure to. So we've seen this in Russia, right? We've seen oligarchs who are right wealthy billionaires in Russia who have ties to Putin. And we've seen the U.S. government and other governments use financial sanctions to effectively cut those actors off from using the dollar system and the financial system. But it also could be a, a firm. And so to go back to the Russia example, um, one of the Russian oligarchs, Oleg Deripaska, was um, uh, was uh, first sanctioned back in 2018, as were all of his businesses. And so he uh, owned and controlled the second largest aluminum producer in the world called Russell. And Russell was, um, was put on the SDN list and was immediately put in a position where it was um, right up against the possibility of defaulting on its debts. It couldn't make debt payments. Uh, it couldn't, again, access uh, finance for trade. And so it really um, effectively cuts off a, a business in that case from being able to 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 function and 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 partake in the, the things that allow it to profit. And then you could see government institutions. The Central Bank of Russia, in a very extreme example, was also uh, sanctioned uh, in 2022. And what that means is uh, you actually can't, the Central Bank of Russia actually cannot transact really in, in foreign exchange markets with the dollar anymore. So it can't like, you know, buy or sell dollars as a way to, to try to prop up the value of the ruble, for instance. Sorry, it, which seems to be a pretty important function for a central bank, right? Very much. Yeah. 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 Cool. Well, thanks, Dan. Uh, I have so I have one more question uh, that I'm coming that I'm going to come with here, but I do want to announce to the folks that are joining us here. Hello again. We've got about 31 participants here today. Welcome, welcome. Uh, please feel free to use the Q&A box or the chat box to uh, uh, address your questions to Professor McDowell, and then uh, we'll we'll get to them uh, momentarily. So. Uh, Dan, I do want to follow up on the 
comment that I raised when I first set the stage for this conversation, which is many more experts, experts <laughs> recently have presented doomsday-like scenario about the US dollar's demise. I mean, Elon Musk himself has chimed in and said, quote, if you weaponize your currency enough times, other countries will stop using it. Ooh. Uh, to what extent do you agree with this? I mean, you have done, uh, you bring in qualitative and quantitative work in your uh, analysis, in your work. And so perhaps you could share with us, first of all, what is your stance on this doomsday-like scenario? Uh, is the dollar share in the world trade really declining? And what, if anything, does this have to do with uh, U.S. financial sanctions that you just mentioned earlier? Yeah. Is there anything that we need to be worried about? Right. Those are good good questions. And you're absolutely right that we've seen a lot more of this recently, especially since the uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and, and the, the sanctions that followed. Um, you know, most of my book was, in fact, pretty much all of my book was completed before that. So the, the, that's important to recognize because this has been a, a concern among some countries uh, for a while, certainly predating Russia. So um, I'll, I'll say two things. Um, one, I agree with the notion that the weaponization of the dollar, the use of the dollar as a coercive tool of foreign policy through sanctions does change the way certain countries think about the dollar, whether they find it appealing as a currency to use for cross-border payments or whether they find it less appealing. Okay, so I think that is true. In fact, that's the fundamental premise of the book, right? I wouldn't, would, I, 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 I couldn't disagree with that point. But the problem is people jump from that observation to making claims about the dollar's um, sort of overall position as the world's most used currency and say, oh, the dollar's dominance is threatened. And that's where I diverge. And I want to say de-dollarization, the process of reducing your use or dependence on the dollar, is something that I view as a country level phenomenon, something that specific countries that are either sanctioned or very worried about being sanctioned, okay, are going to try to figure out how to do. They're going to try to figure out how to reduce their use of the dollar, because that means they're less likely to be able to be, you know, cut out of financial flows. If they're not using American banks and they're not using the dollar, they're a bit more insulated. Okay. But, but the vast majority of countries in the world are not at great risk of being sanctioned. And so the economic appeal of the dollar um, overwhelms any of these political concerns. So, I, you know, what I want to try to do is, you know, hopefully shift the debate toward a place where we can say de-dollarization and concerns about sanction is real. It is happening in certain corners of the world economy, uh, but it is not it is not likely um, to really threaten the dollar's overall use. And so you ask, like, where is the dollar today, right? The dollar accounts for roughly 60% of reserves. That has gone down over the last 20 years, but to be honest, I think most of that is not about um, uh, financial sanctions. Um, I really won't go get into why right now. We can, we can come back to that later. But I think it's more about just diversification for other reasons for central banks. Um, in payments, the dollar's role has actually increased recently. Okay, so we've seen, again, globally, we've seen its role increase. But within specific countries, right, at certain times, we have absolutely seen intentional efforts, um, governments that aren't even hiding their motives. They're, they're publicly saying, uh, we can't trust the dollar. Right. Uh, because the United States uses it for political reasons. Therefore, we have to reduce our reliance on the dollar. We saw it definitely with Russia for years leading up to the invasion. Uh, we've seen it with countries like Turkey, like Venezuela. In many cases, their efforts do not succeed. They fail. OK, so that's the other thing to recognize. It's hard to de-dollarize. Okay, but in some places, it. they've had success. Mm -hmm. And I know we'll talk about China later. That's really the big one for the future is, is China, because we've seen more awareness in China about this as well. Got it. Thanks, Dan. You know, I was I was very curious to uh, to hear about uh, your, your your explanations just now, and I just thought of this question, and I I hope you don't mind answering. It's not really the purview of your book, but I want to tap on your expertise on this, Dan. Um, since a lot of countries realize this, so it looks like the ones who are strategically migrating away from the dollars are the ones who are. Uh, sort of on the not so good economic and foreign policy relations with the U.S. Does that sound correct? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Countries that are, you know, like yeah, non-democratic, that have bad human rights records, that have foreign policy and security preferences that diverge from the U.S. Those are your countries that are most likely to get sanctioned. Got it. Got it. And that might be something. Is 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 there any connection between this sentiment and this uh, recent? A rise of the BRICS phenomenon, the Brazil, Russia, India, uh, China, and South Africa. Uh, 
wanting to increase mm-hmm. their membership and step up their uh, role in the international stage. Dan, what do you think? It's definitely a part of it. I mean, obviously, we know within the BRICS, China's the most important member, right? And so China's driving a lot of that agenda. Um, and increasingly, China and Russia, right, are uh, seeing eye to eye on issues of international finance. Russia, of course, having been a country that is now um, heavily sanctioned in, in dealing with the economic uh, costs of that. And China being a country that I think is very concerned about the possibility of being sanctioned. We're seeing you know, Russia and China use local currencies, meaning their own currencies more in their own trade. Uh, and, um, and so I think they're driving some of that narrative that the BRICS countries should de-dollarize. There are other factors, you know, uh, there are economic reasons for countries to want to like use dollars less and use local currencies more. So it's not all geopolitics. Um, but I would say for the for the for the two big players within the BRICS, the Russians and the Chinese, that the geopolitics, the strategic and security concerns are at, are at the top of mind. India is sort of in the middle, right? India, as we know, is sort of like non-aligned right now with the war. They, you know, they want to kind of have it both ways. I don't think India is, um, you know, necessarily directly worried about being sanctioned by the U.S., but probably worried that U.S. sanctions could disrupt its economic ties to countries like China or Russia, right? We've seen India continue to buy energy from Russia, and it's reportedly also using currencies other than the dollar to do so. So India wants to look after its economic interests first and foremost, and is willing to skirt U.S. sanctions uh, if, if that's what it needs to do. And so I think India also is somewhat aligned on that idea. Um, I do think the idea of a BRICS currency, I'll just end with this, is is really fanciful and not realistic. But um, those conversations definitely are um, are being driven in part by these concerns. You're right. in the in the uh, box and uh, uh most of them are expressions of appreciation uh i do have one last question for you professor mcdowell um so what is in it for the future if we think about future replacements for the dollar how feasible are they uh there are those who think that the chinese renminbi is the strongest candidate to replace the U.S. dollar? Do you agree with this? Uh, what about the euro? What about a non-fiat currency altogether, mm-hmm. if you, you can even call it a currency, which is gold, right? Sure. And how have recent U.S. sanctions affected these calculations? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm yeah, asking you to look into your crystal ball here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, let's real, real quickly start with China. So, you know, China's currency has been pitched as an alternative um, the, the idea that the Chinese currency, the RMB or the yuan, is going to sort of become the the you know the dollar's um, sort of main rival and topple the dollar's dominance, I think, is pretty uh, pretty nuts. And 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 the first reason there is uh, China doesn't. We talked before about the United States having open financial markets, deep and liquid financial markets, and sort of absorbing foreign savings. Essentially, um, China has no real interest right now. Xi Jinping has no real interest in opening up China's financial system. It's quite closed because that allows the system to be insulated from financial shocks. It also allows the currency to be the value of the currency to be controlled. For for Xi's stability, economic and financial stability are far more important than promoting the RMB as a reserve currency. So I think as a reserve currency, we'll see you know you know continued rise. It's around three percent. It will probably continue to go up. Um, in part because of these geopolitical concerns. Some countries might view it as a safer alternative, but I think only marginally. Um, within trade, I think there's where we, we might see more of a role, and that's mostly with China, because again, China is one of these countries that is worried about being possibly isolated like Russia is. And so for China, um, what we're seeing is specific steps being taken to promote the use of the RMB in their own trade, okay, just bilateral trade between China and its trading partners. And so China has really increased from around say 11% of its trade being settled in its own currency about five years ago to today around 30% being settled in its own trade. And I think we'll continue to see that rise. But that's mostly about China trying to insulate itself. It's a defensive rather than trying to, again, make the, the RMB the alternative to the dollar for every other country in the world to use. It's more about China using it for itself. That's my own view. So I think we'll see China's independence from the dollar in payments go up. But I don't think that, again, necessarily or even means at all that the dollar's global role is threatened. So that's the first thing. You mentioned the euro. I mean, the issue with the euro, you know, it is the second global currency. It's around 20% of, of a little more than 20% of global reserves, 20% across border payments. It's used mostly, you know, regionally around Europe. Could it get a larger role? It could. The Europeans would have to come together and issue sort of euro bonds and really develop that 
that full European um, sort of financial market, government debt market. Um, there's been movement a little bit towards that. We saw some of that during COVID, but I think we're still a long way off from that. Um, so again, you asked earlier about, you know, did the United States pursue internationalization of the dollar? At minimum, we can say with the Chinese and the Europeans, neither is completely pursuing internationalization of their currencies because they have reasons to sort of hold back and limit how much they lean into that. Gold, we are seeing more popularity as a reserve asset. Um, the last decade, central banks have been net buyers of gold. 2022 was the biggest year on uh, record, dating back to 2000 for central bank gold purchases. Um, and again, part of that, I think a lot of that is about sanctions concern. China's been a big buyer. Russia bought a ton of gold. Turkey's bought gold. Um, and But there are limits to how much gold you can buy because you can't use gold. It's, it's, it's highly illiquid. It is safe from confiscation because you can hold it in your own vaults, but it's not particularly useful. OK, so uh, it's a security for liquidity trade off. Uh, and so central banks are going to be that are worried about sanctions. They're going to they're probably going to move more into gold to get some more of that security. But you can only have so much. You still have to have dollars to function in the world economy. So I don't think there's a real alternative. Got it. Thank you so much, Dan. This has been a very insightful session. Uh, I want to perhaps just thank all the audience and thank Dan for your time here today. Uh, before we go, though, I, I did see, I, I, I looked at the chat box. There's a quick question on, oh, I think if I'm summarizing it correctly, for those of us here individually who have financial transactions abroad, you know, we have uh, assets in other foreign countries. Should we be worried about the dollar? Because of course we're going to use it, the exchange rate. Uh, well, I mean, this is just an off the cuff comment. Do you have any have any thoughts yeah. about that? Dan? I mean, in in the short term, not at all, right? If anything, we're seeing we're seeing continued dollar strength, um, and uh, and this is even after the Fed has stopped hiking. And of course, we know usually right exchange rates move sort of in concert with with interest rates, especially in, in uh, the US interest rate being the most critical one. So um, the Fed sort of at this point where we've seen the, the end of a period of hiking, maybe we'll see more. It really depends on inflation, as you know. Um, but despite that, despite that, we've seen the dollar actually remain a pretty strong currency. Um, other central banks um, are not responding to sort of strengthen their own currencies. We just I think today or yesterday, you know, Japan sort of held pat and the yen for their weekend. Mm -hmm. And so, um, look, I mean, if you had to to, to stash your, your your savings in any currency in the world over the next year. I mean, I'm not an FX trader and I'm, I'm not going to provide investment advice, but I think dollars are, are definitely the safest place to be. Um, and and that's, that's again, that's the, the general historic reason why um, it maintains that role as that store of value for the world, because I think global confidence is that that's, that is the place to be, right? All other, even if it's not perfect, the alternatives mm -hmm. are, are worse. Wonderful. And on that note, that's a perfect note to end our Friday morning, our warm up to the weekend. Thank you so much again, uh, Daniel McDowell, Associate Professor of Political Science at Syracuse University for joining us today. And thank you to everybody who stayed with us throughout the seminar. I hope we'll see you again at a future School of Business and Economics Fireside Chat. I'm Puspa Ambri signing off. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dan. Have thanks, a good everyone. Morning. Yeah, thanks, Puspa. Bye-bye. Take care.